Welcome, I'm Terry Christensen and this is Valley Politics. Today, San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo will give us an update on the state of the city, including pension reform and a prospective tax increase. Later, Camille Yanes Fontanilla will brief us on the work of Somos Mayfair. As it happens, Camille was also MC for the mayor's recent State of the City address. Then we'll close our show with an interview with Rod Diridon, a longtime leader here in the Valley, and yes, Diridon Station bears his name. All this next on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Mayor Sam Licardo. Thank you, Terry. So tell us, how'd your first year go? Uh, so far, so good. Nobody's impeached me yet. <laughs> no, it's actually been, uh, I've been very blessed to come in at a time as I did. Um, really, as, as the economy's been booming, that certainly helped us, uh, certainly create jobs and have some revenue so we could expand some, some services really strategically in some key areas. And uh, so many ways, I feel like I'm the luckiest mayor in the country uh, coming into San Jose as a time that I did. So in a word or two, how would you characterize the state of the city today? Uh, the state of the city is good and getting better. Uh, I think uh, we've got m more work to do, certainly. But, you know, sometimes we don't appreciate what we've got until mm -hmm. we get outside the city and hear how others view us. I was just uh, speaking at in, in the South by Southwest uh, event last weekend and Dell awarded San Jose uh, the distinction of being the world's most future uh, leaning city. Really? Uh, we rank just ahead of Dell London. Dell Computer. Yeah, Dell yeah. Computer, they do these rankings, yeah. are future looking, something along those lines. And they rank this just uh, above, I think, London and Shanghai. Uh, and you That's don't pretty good. often, you know, we don't often think our, ourselves uh, in the same way that others regard us. And so um, certainly we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, but I, I uh, wouldn't trade uh, this gig for any other city, that's for sure. What are some of your key initiatives for the coming year? <clears throat> well, certainly we want to uh, really push forward uh, with the initiatives we've already launched and make sure they are more successful, more robust. For example, uh, the jobs program that we had for teens during the summertime really focused on getting teens who are living in gang impacted neighborhoods their first job for the summer in partnership with the county and a lot of private sector folks who, who jumped in to help with hiring, uh, folks like Jabel and, and uh, Home Depot and others. We got a, a little over 700 kids uh, employed last summer. We want to get over 1,000 employed this summer. So there are lots of initiatives like that where we simply want to do and more and, and do better. Uh, what we are launching now is really an innovation vision for the city that focuses on how we can uh, U using technology and digital tools, expand opportunity in the city, make the city safer, uh, and take San Jose to the next level in terms of improving service to our residents. So you're gonna see a lot of initiatives born from this vision, and, and we'll be talking about it quite a bit over the next few weeks. Uh, certainly using data analytics to improve uh, how we respond to crime is, is one is tool. Is this what you meant when you said release your geek? Yes. In the state uh, of the city address? Yes, we, uh, the Unleash Your Geek campaign is underway. And the idea is that uh, we all have the ability to be more innovative, particularly since we all share in this DNA of Silicon Valley. Uh, too many, I think, are being left behind. And so an awful lot of this initiative is around inclusion. Uh, it's around expanding, for example, gigabit internet service to neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, where it would be low cost or free, where we know folks cannot otherwise afford uh, to get involved. It's around a tech hire initiative that we're working on with the White House and the Obama administration to get more residents into tech-enabled jobs, which we know are higher paying and it means getting them the job skills they need even if they don't have the college degree. And we're working with a lot of uh, partners like Cisco and, um, and Google on that initiative. So I think there's a lot coming, uh, but it's really, really sort of born around this basic innovation vision of how can we make a city where we know we're gonna continue to have constrained resources fiscally, but how can we do more uh, leveraging the really brilliant minds we have all around us in the Well, Valley. the Dell Award is a good affirmation that that's possible. Absolutely. Yeah. It certainly says an awful lot about our community, and really, let's face it, it's really about the fact that we have the most talented uh, residents and workforce in, in, in the world, and that's what's gotten us here, and we've got to leverage that creativity. So last year, one of the big things we talked about when you came to the show was pension reform and mm -hmm. the potential settlement. So where are we now with all that? 
so the good news is uh, we have negotiated a settlement with all uh, 11 of our unions. Uh, we are um, moving forward to court now. We have, need a settlement to be signed off by the judge. And we are putting the finishing touches on what will be ballot language that will go to the voters in November. And what the voters will see will be language that will say, essentially, by approving this, we will ensure that we do not retroactively increase pension or other benefits. Uh, we do not increase any retirement benefit without a vote of the people that is going to the voters. Uh, and we ensure that our, our plans are actuarially sound. And there also will be a provision that will actually lay out the specific benefits that our employees will be getting and essentially approving them in advance in case there's any kind of statewide mandate that requires that approval. So people will understand and get exactly what it is we're doing and be able to vote on it, essentially. Uh, in the meantime, we're trying to move forward aggressively to get to court, to get this thing settled so that we can really tell our particularly in the police force, our rank and file, uh, that we're moving forward and really boost the hiring that is so critical right now. We've got uh, fewer than 840 street mm -hmm. ready sworn officers. We've got to boost that number quickly and we've got a great plan to do it and involves you know, hiring military veterans and a new program we're launching to help them get in the force. Uh, it involves bringing an awful lot of our officers back home who have been interested in coming back home as soon as we get this settled. I think there's great opportunity to move, but we gotta get to court and get this resolved. And that's really impressive progress. Congratulations. Thank that you. That was a big challenge. You had substantial council majority support yeah. on this, right? Yeah, really kudos, by the way, goes to uh, you know, our employees and, and yeah. the union representatives. Uh, people really stepped up in a way that maybe wasn't possible. There wasn't political space for that in years past. Uh, but people stepped up in a big way and recognized that hey, we've got to find a way to tighten the belt together. And, and this is going to save taxpayers $3 billion over the next 30 years. But a possible setback on the process recently. One of yeah. your former colleagues, in fact, a former staff member for you as mayor and a yeah. uh, former member of your informal advisory uh, yeah. kitchen cabinet, Pete Constant, and others filed a lawsuit about the process for getting to this. How big a setback is that lawsuit likely to be? You know, time will tell. I. I you know, I, I, I'm always reluctant to guess how a judge is going to rule because I'm usually wrong. Uh, but I'm sure you weren't when you were a prosecutor. Yeah, that's true. It's a lot easier being a DA. <laughs> <laughs> I only prosecuted righteous cases. That's why. <laughs> uh, you know, the uh, I would expect that the judge will sign off on the settlement uh, when you've got all the parties coming together as we are. Nonetheless, they're likely going to appeal it. Uh, and this is uh, a group of folks who ideologically don't agree with what we're doing. I get it. Um, uh, many of the folks who are pushing on this don't live in the city, so mm -hmm. they're not the ones who are most concerned about whether or not a police officer or firefighter can show up on time uh, when there's a critical incident. But uh, the reality is, is uh, this litigation is going to continue. I would expect it to because it'll go on appeal or whatever. The critical thing is that we get to the voters in November because if the voters can approve this package in November, as far as I can tell, there's really no legal means or no air for this thing to continue, for this fire to continue. It puts it all out. Once the voters have signed off, I, I think there's really no argument that this is the law. And do you think the voters will get there? I think so. I think we've got a strong coalition. You know, Mayor Chuck Reed, my predecessor, uh, supports the settlement. Uh, I support it, and we've both been strong proponents of pension reform. And then we'll have uh, labor leaders also stepping up, saying they support it, uh, business leaders, the Chamber of Commerce, others, they'll, they'll all be with us. As I mentioned, one of the litigants in this, in this challenge uh, was a member of your kitchen cabinet, mm -hmm. the informal advisory group. And you took some flack from the media about the kitchen cabinet yeah. for not posting it on your calendar and right. for the composition of the, the folks who are part of that. Right. What's the status of your kitchen cabinet at the moment? Uh, I have actually lots of sort of kitchen cabinets. Yeah. Uh, th that one has, has come and gone. I take advice from a lot of folks. Uh, and uh, it is quite customary for mayors to do that. Whenever I'm meeting with a developer or a lobbyist or anyone who's got an interest in a project, you better believe it's on my calendar, but I'm not gonna list every individual who I ever get advice from on the calendar because it would be pretty burdensome to do that. I'm not sure I, I even have the time for that. And frankly, I'm not sure that many people care. It is customary for mayors to do that. I helped J Mayor Janet Gray Hayes form a kitchen cabinet back in 1975. Yes. Uh, so uh, this, this is this is a tradition. Of course, the requirements of transparency and posting everything were different. a lot different back in 1975. 
Yeah. Well, another big issue that's coming to the ballot is the general uh, is the general tax uh, general sales tax increase right. that uh, the council approved and that you uh, talked about in your State of the City speech. Why did you go for a general tax, general, ta uh, general tax, sales tax, quarter, quarter set, rather than uh, an earmarked or a specific tax for public safety and roads? You know, I guess two reasons. One is, um, frankly, there wasn't political support for a specific tax. It has a much higher hurdle. You need to get two thirds, two -thirds of the yeah. voters to support it. Um, we've done that in some circumstances where we've clearly seen the polling supports it. Um, but it's really hard to get two-thirds of uh, anyone in California to agree on much of anything, let alone a tax increase, um, and the polling wasn't supporting it. it. It was also clear to me that, you know, I'm not sure we even had a consensus about what would be in the specific tax. Uh -huh. Certainly we all agree public safety would be a cornerstone of that, whatever it is. Uh, certainly many would say our roads need repair, but we also have gang prevention programs. We have homeless services. Uh, there are lots of things that need attention. Um, I don't doubt that we will be prioritizing spending around some basic things like public safety and roads, but, uh, but the needs are everywhere. About half the council seats uh, are up in the coming election mm -hmm. uh, as well. A couple of incumbents likely to get, uh, to get reelected. Are you going to endorse in the other races, the open seats? Uh, I've only endorsed in one so far. It's Norm Klein in District 6. Uh, I, I don't expect I'll be endorsing in the primaries of any of those races. I'll probably be endorsing I would venture to guess on all of them in the runoff. Uh, it's pretty early and you're still trying to assess who's, uh, yeah. you know, what people are candidates. saying and, and whether or not um, they're, they're consistently saying whatever they, they're saying to, mm -hmm. to you. And so it's important for me to hear it all out uh, before I jump in. Mercury News, among others, thinks that this election could shift the balance, the labor business balance on the city council. Uh, and that's possible. Um, it seems to me the council's division has moved in a little bit different direction over the last couple of years. So uh, some council members want to stick to what they call core services. Those mm -hmm. are the ones who actually support, supported an earmarked or specific tax mm -hmm. for public safety and roads. And the substantial majority of the council, including you, uh, seem to have a broader view of what, what the city should be doing. Do you think that's a reasonable view of the division on the council? You know, th that's certainly one way to slice it. Um, I, I'm not, you know, there, I'm sure we can uh, come up with other divisions as well. I, I think, you know, we could all agree uh, that we should only be funding core services. The real question is, what are those core services? Um, because um, certainly I consider it critical to public safety that we have uh, gang prevention programs that get teenagers involved in, uh, in after school um, learning or sports or other programs uh, in, in gang impacted neighborhoods. I think that's a critical public safety core function. Others would disagree. And so, you know, we, we will disagree about what exactly core services are, but um, I think the important thing is that this council has been working together like none other that I've been on in the last decade. Uh, we've had some really tough divisions in this city and we've managed to get through a very complex and difficult negotiating, uh, negotiation on pension reform with near unanimity. Uh, we've come to agreement now with 11 bargaining units on pay. Uh, we have managed to get a budget passed unanimously. Uh, those are the kinds of things that hadn't really been happening for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I feel blessed that I'm working with colleagues who understand the value of collaborating. And three or four new colleagues are unlikely to shake that up too much. We'll find out. We'll it all find depends out. how it works out. But, we'll you know, we'll out. reach out to them, and, and, uh, and I think we'll have a good group. Some of your critics in the first year thought you were a little too ambitious mm -hmm. in terms of the range of initiatives that you undertook. Um, how do you respond to that? Do you think some of those initiatives fell by the wayside? Are you able to keep track of as much as you put forward? Well, it's a fair criticism that we're very ambitious. Um, and I think the good news is, is I looked at my State of the City speech from last year because I was looking at it as I was thinking about my priorities for this year. I looked too. Um, you know, we checked <laughs> the boxes. We, <laughs> we did what we said we were going to do. Um, you know, we, we launched the San Jose Works program, the teen uh, jobs program that was really focused on gang prevention. Uh, we la launched an after school initiative uh, serving uh, over 650 kids in 13 of our poorest neighborhoods, uh, really trying to see how we can boost uh, learning to, to get every third grader up to reading and math. Uh, 
because we know that's such a critical determinant for their future. Uh, we were successful in resolving uh, the pension battles. Uh, we certainly have a lot more work to do, but uh, the good news is we were appropriately ambitious, right? We said, we said what we were gonna do, and because I've got a great team around me, we got it done. Um, we just got a lot more to do. Meanwhile, you're an avid cyclist. Are you getting time on your bike? No. No. Yes. I'm, I'm, very, uh, <laughs> I'm very unhappy about that. I actually had a little fall on my bike oh. about six or eight weeks ago, and I had this giant hematoma on my leg, which was awful. Uh, so I've kind of nursed that back to health, but I'll get back on the bike soon. Well, let's hope, let's hope you do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Sam Licardo. Thanks, Terry. It's been a pleasure. Now let's hear what some residents have to say about the top priorities for the city in the coming year. It should be homelessness because it's starting to seep into, uh, into the neighborhoods, of uh, many neighborhoods. Okay, I think the mayor should be concerned with uh, renters' rights, uh, uh, evictions, and also the homeless and dealing with uh, how they're being swept from place to place and there's no real solution to what's going on. Public safety, uh, maintaining economic viability of this uh, community, as well as uh, providing for uh, infrastructure. Helping people that want to get out of poverty. The top priority must be addressing the housing crisis and ensuring renters have protections and rights. I'm an elementary school principal, so schools really is a, a top priority for me. I'd love to see better innovation in our schools, especially in our public neighborhood settings. And, uh, you know, a second priority really is uh, safety. You know, uh, making sure we restore our, our community policing and uh, get, keeping our neighborhoods safe and, and uh, thriving. I think that the mayor should focus on strengthening rent control. A lot of the uh, tenants of San Jose are suffering due to the high increases of rent. You know, a lot of people are commuting really far away, moving out because they can't afford to live here anymore. Now it's time for Community News with Camille Yanes Fontanilla of Somos Mayfair. Somos Mayfair is a community-based organization in the Mayfair neighborhood of East San Jose, one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city. First established in the early 1900s, Mayfair has always been home to working poor immigrant families. Today, Mayfair is home to over 13,000 residents. At Somos Mayfair, we implement a unique and innovative approach that is executed at the hands of community leaders and activists, or promotoras, we work with over 500 families with children ages 0 to 8 in the neighborhood to close the opportunity and achievement gaps. Toward these goals, Somos Mayfair organizes a broad network of neighborhood leaders who are building a grassroots movement of families working together to ensure that our children are entering kindergarten fully ready for school, our children are proficient readers by the end of third grade, and that community members are demonstrating personal and collective action to help move the needle on critical community issues. To learn more about our work and to get engaged in our efforts, visit SomosMayfair.org. Thank you so much for your attention. Next on Where Are They Now? We talk with Rod Diridon, who among other things, served on the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors from 1975 to 1995. Let's take a look. Rod Deard, and thank you very much for welcoming us, welcoming us into your very interesting office here at the Mineta Transportation Institute. Nice to have you, Terry. We're going to talk about your long political career, almost 25 years in office, including 20 years as a county supervisor. But first, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing since you left public office. Well, I left in 1995 because of term limits being adopted. And I uh, uh, was asked at that time by the directors of the newly created Mineta Transportation Institute to assume the directorship, executive directorship of that uh, National Transportation Research Center. Uh, I had been the chair of that board mm -hmm. and uh, I wrote the legislation that uh, Congressman Mineta carried to create it. And so it was a natural evolution. 
uh, the position didn't pay very much, but I've never worked for money. <laughs> and and it um, evolved up now so that it's become a very powerful uh, think tank. It has 230 PhDs in nine wow. countries, uh, working on 40 projects currently. We are, are the lead institution over nine other universities. Uh, the money comes through us, we guide them in doing the research, and we publish the research for all of them. So it's, it's quite powerful now. We have a master's in transportation management. The state university system allows us to do through San Jose State, mm -hmm. and we do it through video conferencing, uh, through the uh, Caltrans video conference network to 28 sites uh, four nights a week all over the state. So it's quite a good thing. We have almost a thousand graduates now, many of them in executive positions in transportation. And this pretty much started from scratch when you took over there to was grow to this scale. There was nothing uh, in 95 except a grant from the federal government to get it started. I arranged um, matching funds from the state and we've continued on that basis. After being created by law, we won competitions in uh, five of them now and I expect we would continue and do very well. And you're retiring from the position of executive director or becoming executive director emeritus. I have become executive director emeritus. Yeah. Smartest thing I did was to <laughs> hire Karen Philbrick, Dr. Philbrick, who is a whiz, and she's the new director and uh, doing a great job. Always a challenge in finding the right successor, so congratulations for that. Thank you. Let's go way back in your career, though, back to the 70s. So I first became aware of you, uh, not when you were on the Saratoga City Council, but when you were doing uh, public opinion polling with the Derridon Research Corporation. Oh, yes. We were both children. What, uh, what got you into that line of work? My favorite professor in my graduate work was Ted Seeloff. He was a statistics professor. Where did you do your graduate work? San Jose State. Well, of course. Absolutely. My family has 10 degrees <laughs> from San Jose State University. So far. And we're more coming. <laughs> and uh, so I took a statistics class from Ted, and then I'm dyslexic. And I mm. thought I'd have a hard time. But statistics is pure logic, mm -hmm. and I can do it in my head. Mm -hmm. And so I, it just clicked, and, and I was a whiz at it. And so uh, I took another class from Ted. And then we started talking about starting a business after I got out of the Navy. And we did. Uh, I went to work for Lockheed at first, get things settled, and then we started a business. And then he couldn't be involved in the business because one of our first clients was San Jose State. Uh -huh. And so uh, we, uh, I settled down with a couple of other members of a board, many of whom you know, and made a success out of it. Well, I just happened to find the uh -huh. survey you did for the Janet Gray Hayes for Mayor campaign in 1974. I was volunteering on that campaign. Do you want to know how you did? Yes. Well, you were within two percentage point of the final percentages in the primary, which is pretty good. It's well within the margin of error. Oh, yes. And in a primary, surveying is always a little more challenging. Because of turnout. Anyway. Right. So We did uh, the same thing. When this really showed that we were going to be successful was the McCorkadale Quinn campaign. Ah, 1972. 72. And we'd been going for about two years, but in low visibility work. And then this came up, it was higher visibility, and uh, we came out right on the percentage mm -hmm. point. And I was doing commentary work for Channel 11. You later did that yourself. And uh, I remember Fred Lacoste saying, how could you be so accurate? <laughs> I said, well, the, the statistics don't lie. <laughs> well, something else happened in 1974. You ran for county supervisor. Yes. You ran against, against Ralph Merkins, a longtime, old-time, old guard county supervisor. Um, you were, a, at, the, at that time, a city council member in Saratoga, right? And That's right. One of the youngest ever elected. But So, young city council member, starting a fairly new business. What on earth led you to run against such a long time, such, a, such an entrenched incumbent for county board? Well, I think two things. One, I was precocious. <laughs> um, at, 
We were both very young then, Terry, as you recall. <laughs> yeah. And we were too dumb not to realize <laughs> that we couldn't conquer the world. And the second is that we worked very hard in 1972 to adopt a measure that, uh, that directed the county to use their excess sales tax, not sales tax, property tax revenue, it's coming from amortizing bonds, mm -hmm. to build an arena, sports arena. A lot of people like uh, Tony Ritter and Hal Gilliland and others worked on that campaign, the labor unions and so on. And then the county, three votes on the county board, voted to build the county administration building uh -huh. with that excess revenue. And it made us all very angry. The people in the valley had voted overwhelmingly to create the arena. And now there wasn't enough money for the arena. And so several of the folks came to me and said, we want you to run against Mr. Merkins. Well, I liked him. He's a, just a nice, nice old fellow. And there's one, one more point too. The board at that time, except for Dan and Dominic, Dom was kind of on the fringe. Uh, was That's Dominic Cortese. Dom Cortese. Dan McCorkadale. Dan McCorkadale were very conservative. They were the old yeah. farming Republican yeah. group. They worked part-time, they had only one staff member, and they they thought the board ought to do whatever the county executive asked them to do. And the county executive, Howard Campen, Howard Campen. was a wonderful fellow. Yeah. Ran up, a very conservative, <laughs> tight ship, but he was conservative. And I knew it was time for a change. And so I, I knew that if I was elected, there'd be three votes on the liberal side. That would be you and Dan McCorkadale and Dominic and Dom Cortese. Cortese. Yeah. And so I ran. And everybody said, kid, you're not going to have a chance. <laughs> Ralph's been there for 15 years, yeah. 16 years. He's loved by everybody. And so I walked every precinct twice, raised some money, not a lot. Had some help from the labor unions because mm -hmm. they didn't like the conservative county and and from the environmental community. I was a no growth candidate. Of course, I did, didn't realize that was impossible. And one. Next month, we'll focus on the upcoming June election and we'll hear more from Rod Diridon. Meanwhile, you can catch up on previous shows on our website at createvsj.org or on YouTube. Just search for CreateTV San Jose. You can also email comments to us at valleypolitics at createvsj.org and you can follow us on Facebook where you can post comments, suggest topics, and send us questions for future guests. And now that's all folks. Thanks for watching Valley Politics today. See you next time. Do you care what's happening in your community? We do, which is why CreateTV makes it a priority to bring you shows like Valley Politics. But we need your help. CreateTV relies on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you to provide our community with informative local programming. If you like what you're watching, go to createvsj.org and make a one-time donation, or become an ongoing supporter through our friends of CreateTV. Thanks for watching.